Good evening, folks. My name is Damien Willie, better known as Cornish Damo. And after a bit of a hiatus, I'm back on a Sunday night with a special guest or two to discuss the world as we're finding it. And this week, it feels like it's coming down around our ears. The government have decided in their infinite lack of wisdom to do away with the vast majority of COVID restrictions, even though cases are on the rise once more, currently at their highest since February. School bubbles are to end. Mask wearing is no longer a requirement. School distancing gone. Stadiums can fill up once more. The requirement to shield ends. And the last place is still closed can reopen. Nightclubs and the like. Here we go again. Joining me to discuss some of the ramifications of this science-defying lack of common sense, I'm joined by Claire from Safe Head for All and Emmy from Shield Us, both not-for-profit organisations who respectively campaign for more awareness of how schools have not been safe environments for students to study in and to raise awareness of long-term sick, disabled and vulnerable people who need to shield in order to stay well. I'm also delighted to be joined by Michelle, who has a harrowing story to share with us concerning her and her family's health and welfare, and which actually encompasses a lot of the work of both Safe Ed and Shield Us, and will also speak to an awful lot of families out there as well. She's far from alone. So, welcome, Claire and Emmy. Welcome back to Social Tell. You both been on before. Welcome, Michelle, for the first time. Everybody's got to have a first time. Sorry, it's not under more positive circumstances. How is everybody? Cross, scared, mm. and frustrated. Okay. Yeah, it is better. <laughs> Yeah, isn't it just? So you've all heard the news by now. 19th of July, Freedom Day. How free is it going to feel for you and the people your organisations represent? Claire, should we start with you? Not at all. Not at all. Um, a lot of us have, are either clinically vulnerable, CV, or we have children that are, uh, or family members that are, which again puts everybody at risk. No, I think a lot of us are just going to be at home. So it's not much fun for anybody. And it's, of course, so well organised. There's no actual support either. So that's going to be really helpful, isn't it? Mm. it? It's a recipe for disaster. I mean, the hospitals are filling up. Cases are sky high. So what would we do? Abandon, abandon everything. I mean, you know, the international press think we're stark raving bonkers. Well, so we do too. <laughs> well, we do, but we it's go. like when you're reading, you know, your sort of German newspapers that say has Boris Johnson lost his mind, or Danish ones that go, Have the English gone mad? You know, it's or CNN saying it's a social experiment on the yeah. population. Mm. Says, oh. What was it? What was it? Eric Ding said something about oh, it was moral emptiness. And... That was Professor my, um, Dr. Ryan from the World yeah, Health. Dr. Ryan, yeah, Dr. Ryan. Yeah, I think. I, yeah, I think yeah, he was he quoting him. Yeah. yeah, it was, and he's right. And I watched, I watched that clip. Yeah. Over and over because it was one of those moments when the hairs just stand in the back yeah. of your neck. You're just like, how can everybody else see yeah. this, and nobody in this country be doing anything about it? Yeah. Talking when, about us in this in this context that we're exactly all and we have a media that's just going, what are they going to work? Is it going to work? Let's see, let's see. It, they're, they're looking for a, a big story out of this. They're 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 waiting yeah. for the disaster to come because it'll solve. Well, yeah, because it's it's it, doomsday to them. They're like they're, in terms of lives. No, they're, they're not under together. any risk. They're not oh. under any risk. You know, they've probably let's be brutally honest. Their children are at private school. They have the money to go and get them privately vaccinated. If it's been passed by the MHRA, are you telling me private paediatricians are not giving it out? I bet they are. They, they've got the space. They've got the money. You know, it's the ordinary people who are going to get, you know, who are going to get absolutely flattened by it. You know, the people who live five to a house in a tiny house, uh, you know, in poor areas. I mean, I live in a, in, in a, in a quite a poor area of Morecambe. And it's impossible to socially distance around here. It's literally impossible. It's, it's small. There's generally far too many people living in a house. And this, these are the people that are going to get sick. Yeah, it's the minorities. It's always been the minorities. And yeah. then you just need to look at the heat map, you know, yeah. from the 1918, you know, to, to, to the present day. I mean, to, to it, it's, there, there isn't any change. And... Yeah. You know, we've got a national health service and, you know, there should be change and there isn't. It's the minorities. It's going backwards. It's going, yeah, unfortunately. Um, it's really, really difficult. I mean, for CED people, 
a lot of us are still shielding and haven't stopped. And this is with zero support, no support whatsoever. No. It's put us in a position where our kids attending school has either been down, been blessed and lucky and had an amazing relationship with your school and been able to um, have continued remote learning. I'm not in the minority with this. I've got that with my school and they've been wonderful. But I know come September, that's most likely going to change because what's happening now, we, we, we are, we're not removing our masks um, apart from in places of worship. That was announced yesterday. In places of worship, yeah. masks are being removed in Northern Ireland. Um, but they're going to be reviewing the masks um, come August. Our hospitals are at breaking point with backlogs. We had the worst waiting times you know a simple thing my my um, family members needing a, cal a calcium deposit taken off of a shoulder blade mm. agonizing five years she's been waiting you know yeah. the waiting lists are Backlog, really yeah, and, it's in the millions I think and it is and then we, that's all the routine treatment it's just like yeah. i've had none of my pain treatments since december 2019 and i've been trying to juggle home ed and everything else on top of that well, it's an excruciating pain, but you can't even get the, to see the GP to adjust that because I haven't seen a GP in person since then either. Oh, I managed to see my GP in person, but I had to do a COVID test first and she mm. was wonderful. Again, I'm blessed with an amazing <laughs> GP surgery, mm -hmm. but I'm medically complex. I really need, I've all the way throughout this, I've been really well supported by my, GP's pra my GP practice. Um, my clinical team have been fantastic as well. And my children's school have been fantastic. So, like anything, if there's good practice, you shout it from the rooftops because it can yeah. be done. It can it be done. Exactly. Then we've got the absolute opposite end of the spectrum where we have mine. got... Mine yeah. and Michelle's experiences. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's not the way it should be. I mean, you can... I, people... and The off-rolling thing is something that really gets me. Um, I had to homeschool my son very quickly with no, <laughs> very little warning due to a health condition. Um, this was a few years ago uh -huh. and it literally happened overnight <clears throat> that's yeah. not a decision you make lightly the it amount isn't. of work you need to do and to be able to provide a curriculum and you know the, the I'm rules a and teacher, regulations but I'm just not well enough to do it because I'm not getting the treatments I need mm -hmm. if I was getting the treatments I needed and I'd independently decided it but it got to the point where I was literally forced to offer all my son yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm going to come on to that actually, Claire, because um, yeah. speaking to you previously, you're the mother of a, a, a send child. Your son has special educational needs. You've since yeah. taken the decision to deregister. Uh, I know your safe ed colleague, Lisa Diaz, had done similarly when we spoke before, when you guys were on before. It's always yeah. stuck in my mind how close to, to tears, how emotional she got over the way she was being treated by yeah. her kids school. I understand for her things a little better now. She was unable to join us today, sadly. <laughs> Uh, but the, you're having the same battle with your kids' school now as well, I understand. Oh, it got worse and worse. I mean, I told you, I think last time after, the, the lovely attitude when my dad died. Mm. And uh, they told me they didn't care if my dad was dead, Emmy. It was lovely. And oh. um, that sort of went on and on. And it got to March the 8th. And then they just flatly refused to provide any remote learning at all. Took the laptop back. And I said, you know, you're not providing any. Uh, he comes back or we're not doing anything. He comes back or we're not doing anything. And then eventually uh, they called social services on me. They referred me to social services. I've heard this uh, a lot, Claire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the funny, of course, the completely ironic thing is I used to work in child protection. That used to be my job. Mm. And at this point, I was just like, right, that's it. I'm, I'm deregistering. I've just had enough. It was game playing. And I think too much power has been put in the hands of heads. Yeah. And some of them are small gods. They really like it. They are really enjoying it. And they are, they are playing that power dimension with parents. And I think a lot of mine, I mean, and the, so, the social worker kind of agreed that it was absolute revenge because I, when I was a counsellor, I used to help parents and sometimes it brought me into conflict with the head mm. so uh this was her revenge I, I mean i was lucky the referral did not go through you know i spoke to social services and they said 
we have no reason to accept a referral. Uh, we think it's just a revenge act. We think it's really stupid. We're not even recording it. But, I mean, I'm a trained teacher. If I'm ever going back to teaching, can you imagine how a social services referral would look on my teaching record? Of course, of course. But, you know, it, it's, it, it, the, the irony here is that you've deregistered I bet you've heard absolutely nothing from social services now, heard I, nothing from the school now, mm -hmm. there's no power anymore to threaten you with social services, and now all of a oh. sudden they don't care anymore, you're, you're no longer yeah. the problem. Um, so I, have, I got told I'd be wrong by the Home Education Service, and that was May the 18th. Mm. I'm still waiting. I haven't received letter, phone call, anything. I got told, oh yes, we'll support you. Big fat zero. I wasn't expecting it anyway, to be honest. I mean, you know, the way it's been going, I've just thought, um, what, what's that? What's that? Um, expect the worst, hope for the best sort of thing. You know, I just, it, it's been so bad. And I think most of us have got to that stage. It's <clears> like, <throat> we're not expecting anything now. No. And, but it's a disgusting yeah. state of affairs to be in with your own country and your own education system. And it, especially in the case, that, I mean, Caspian's got an EHCP. So he should be, you know, he, they have a stat duty of education to him. Mm -hmm. And the fight to get one in the yeah. first place. I have two send children myself. Six and the years. fight and the battle, exactly the same. My son um, took to primary seven to get him his placement. Finally get him his placement. The thought that I may have to face off ruling in September because we aren't being written into the guidelines to protect us. Yeah. You know, our, our CEV and the thought that I, and because I've already, you know, thought about this long and hard. Yeah. And I'd rather be alive for my children yeah. than. That's my decision, exactly. Yeah. And that's not okay. That's not an okay thought to be running through your head at four o'clock in the morning when you can't sleep no. and you. No. Though that, it is that simple. There was a time. It, there was a time schools it, used to be, you know, the the heart and beating heart of a community, and now yeah. they no longer see themselves as that. Or you know, the, 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 what what governments over successive numbers of years have essentially done to gut them of of what they uh, what they're capable of and what they can and can't do to the point that they dare not speak yeah. out. They dare not back the parent anymore for fear of losing even more. Yeah. It seems and we end up with schools that now no longer care. It's a real postcode lottery because I know I'm not, I know other families around my area who are in the same position as me, mm. who have not only been able to continue shielding as a family unit, but I've had the phone calls, not about schoolwork, not about anything other than how you coping, how you, you know, genuine check-ins, genuine care, mobile numbers phone me anytime you know it can be done What's and this is what's yeah. so frustrating the level of care and love and support i've had from my school my son's mm. school is just been it's been yeah. it's honestly, the blanket of contrast between the it's two the, of you though. yeah exactly and it's the blanket assumptions that all families are the same they all have the same issues if we make one rule it's going to apply to all of them well we're not you're not no, but you know, the guidelines. The guidelines are so. Again, I've always said all the way along this whole pandemic, it's open to interpretation. Yeah, oh, yeah. Guidelines. And that's the problem. And they're not, not all laws or rules. Guidelines. So and they're when written it like that, wrong. they then have an excuse to blame you when everything yeah. goes wrong. But it's just it's a, a way of just exonerating them of any false claim. Yeah. And but unfortunately, the guidelines really put the full onus on the school. If you've got no, you've got no legal inroad to the government who writ, who have written these guidelines, you know, for, for a legal challenge, you're literally looking at having to take a school and go right. Well, this lands on your doorstep, and I don't know if the school community actually knows how much if a child, oh, the amount of children with long COVID. If that's proven to have been contracted in school and a family has fought to keep their child home and keep them safe yeah. and that family decides to, you know, go for the legal aspect and go, right, well, somebody is going to be responsible for my yeah. child being disabled. Yeah. It's not the government. The guidelines oh, are teacher. written. So the guidelines are written in such a way it is all on the school.
Yeah. Now, Emmy, your um, organisation, Shield Us, look out for those whose health, as the name as implied, requires them to shield. Often people who were sent letters by the government instructing them to do so not so long ago. But shielding was ended a, a short while ago now. My wife was CEV. She had a letter. She had it all ended as well. But now all those people must return to work, return to school. Many won't be vaccinated. They haven't suddenly developed better immunity. <laughs> We're talking percent of the population being fully vaccinated right now. I would think there's an awful lot of worried people that have been speaking to you. I know, as you've already said yourself, you're, you're CEV. You're clinically extremely vulnerable yourself. Uh, I'd imagine you're very much one of them. Uh, you pretty much, you know... I'm not afraid to see it. Speaking to us now, but what advice yeah. is Shield Us offering right now to people rightfully concerned about their health in light of what the government is doing? Unfortunately, it's the only place that they've got to go is the clinicians. But clinicians are making it very, very clear. It's They cannot make a decision for a whole family unit based on one family member. Mm. You're putting a GP, so, you know, not everybody's got access to their consultant care. You're asking a GP, quick phone call, I need, should I continue shielding? Take somebody who's a severely immunosuppressed, and I can give you a million reasons why severely immunosuppressed people need to be shielding right mm. now. Mm. Um, even with double vaccine, we are not, John Hopkins University are yeah. doing the studies and thank God for them because we've got a bit more information than we had. But we're, we know this ourselves. We know this ourselves. We know our own health, something again that we're constantly banging the drum for and shield us. We know our own health. We know yeah. what a winter looks yeah. like to us. We have to risk assess our day every single day. Mm. Yeah. Don't talk about appetite for risk. This is our lives. This is how we live. So when we're all of a sudden told that there's a virus that, you know, nobody saw coming and your life is in danger, you've got to remember there's also people who would never in a million years have considered their lives in danger because of a condition. Yeah. And these people were sent home terrified. With very little support. Thank God for, you know, community organisations and you know, the food parcels and the check-ins, where's the money for that to continue? The councils haven't got it. It's not being supplied. The universal no. credit card as well. People are going to... Everybody's stop. run... Everybody has run out SSP now. So, you know, yes, it's universal yeah. credit. What the problem is now is, as I said, I'll use Amina Suppress because I can talk personally about that. I have been told to continue shielding even after my second vaccine. Again, but then there's I've others been... who are nebulous. I mean, I've got I've, most of the things wrong with me are autoimmune. Yeah, autoimmune and is can't a huge thing. No, and, and this appear on some lists and not others, which doesn't make life easy. No, this is another thing. A lot of people don't actually know their CV status. Another thing that I heard of, um, I have been hearing of, um, over the past few days, um, since the new announcements have come out about relaxations, is people losing their CV status from occupational health. Yeah. It started happening. And these are people who are working in public facing roles in non-ventilated areas, face to face with the public, no natural air coming through. We're talking bus drivers. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're talking- But ventilation has been a disaster waiting to happen. It has, it has. I, I mean, the amount of, I mean, I remember when I worked with the social services department, sick building syndrome. I have never been so sick in my entire life. But most of the offices I worked in, some of them didn't even have windows. And you'd have people who are like, oh, I don't want, I don't want, they, they, even if there was ventilation, you'd have people who go, oh, I don't like it on. So... I mean, when you talk about ventilation, quite often the conversation ends up turning to schools because these places are unfortunately ram-packed because the government sent everybody back to school. And uh, the, the, the level of ventilation from one school building to another varies a lot. And I know the point was made, uh, we've made it previously on this show when I had, uh, when I've been talking to Independent Sage and uh, NHS activists, that uh, in New York, in actual fact, it came up on the press conference um, from Caroline Lucas with um, uh, that was organized by Dr. Deep D. Gurdasani, um, mm. that in New York, you can actually look up online the ventilation status yeah. of your kid's school. 
and mm -hmm. you can look up each and every individual classroom. You can see what ventilation is there, whether they've yeah. got fans, whether how many windows they've got, what the uh, level of CO2 buildup in the air in those classrooms is. And you can see just how well ventilated the places your child is going to sit. And you think, mm -hmm. well, bloody hell, it's a website. It's only, it's only data collection, ultimately, yes. in each and every school. Collect it. Any That's teacher will tell you. That's what's going on. And the same Any teacher will tell you kids get tired in the class. Honestly, on a try teaching children on a Friday afternoon in a room with windows that don't open in the middle of winter. Mm -hmm. You will watch. Certain children are also more sensitive than others to it. You'll see gradually they'll start dropping. Yeah, my, like, my son would be one of them. He gets to about one o'clock in the afternoon and mm -hmm. he's just yeah, useless. I, I was like, I, <laughs> So bad as a child, I got tested for narcolepsy because it used to happen so often. Mm -hmm. And but it's been like that for years, and it's not healthy for children at all. And that's one of the reasons that schools have always been petri dishes: the bad ventilation. Well, here's the thing: a lot of our um, CV um, families have discovered for their CV children, this is they're having incredibly good spells of health. That they've never experienced before and it's because they're not in that school environment where you know they're catching every single yeah, dog and nasty that's going yeah. but and it, uh, from a CV family and child standpoint you know these children were put into shielding yeah for us adults it was hard to understand yes. it was very very difficult um and then the rules kept changing and, you know, we're back and forward. And, you know, your child has got to trust you, especially when you've got, a, a, you know, a chronically ill child. Yeah. When you're going back and forward for appointments and procedures and tests, they need to be able to trust that their parent, their, you know, they have to, their guardian, to tell them they can't go to school and see their friends because it's not yeah. safe, causes a virus, and to have this drumming over and over and over and over and over and over again, then no shielding, and get to school, and kids going like, well, so is COVID gone? The mental health yeah. of our children has been massively impacted on this one. It's a really, really big thing. You're going to end uh, up with half a country, and, and, and a lot of that will be children with PTSD at the end mm. of it. Yeah. You really are because of the way it's not just, you know, if, if there was a virus, it was sorted. That was the end of it. That would be one thing. But it's the backwards, the forwards, the the isolation the not being supported above all. The fact that, you know, your own government doesn't care, try not to swear. Doesn't care about you, doesn't care about you at all and doesn't care about your family and doesn't care about what's dear to you. All of that is, you know, it's going to impact on people at the end of this. You know, people are going to be exhausted and mentally ill yeah now i want to uh move on to uh another aspect of uh this 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 uh, interview today we're joined today by a lady called michelle whose story actually relates a lot to the work of both safe ed and shield us and also uh is reflective of much of the conversation that we've had here already tonight uh michelle thank you very much for coming on to join us uh would you like to Relate to your story to us, please. Explain what's going on. Yeah. Um, so obviously, when the pandemic began, we, as a family, made the sort of difficult decision to homeschool um, because, you know, for a number of reasons, really, uh, we, we didn't know what was going on. Um, we didn't know how much would be contributing to community transmission uh, at that point. So um, September the schools were sort of, they were allowing a certain amount of non-attendance and uh, it was amicable. And then it's gotten to a point in which uh, the schools feel that they're having to follow these policies that in actual effect are a lot more detrimental than helpful. And it's, it's brought up a lot of questions for a lot of families um, in terms of what do we do you know to be cautioned as a parent with all these pressures on us without support is just completely unbelievable to me and um it sort of I, I felt really alone in it in the city and the school sort of amplified that to me saying I was you know one out of 1100 people's 
and I was a parent that I was the only parent sort of thing that had an issue and you, you sort of start to question yourself a lot and it's only in joining the unions that I've been able to sort of stand a lot firmer and go no you know what I, this is worth pushing for this is absolutely worth pushing for it's going to be an issue that continues to spiral um and it, something needs to be done about it it's it's it, it's been awful now you're background you're you're clinically extremely vulnerable yourself you have a, a a couple of conditions um you've homeschooled the kids at home for about five hours every day and you've ended up sacrificing your own business to do so yeah. um, so all this talk of the government saying well we need to get people back to work we need to get the economy moving actually yeah. the effect they're having on families especially families like yours and, and businesses with employees or even if you're self-employed mm. it's detrimental economically as well as well as being i mean i'm not saying the economy should ever be put first i'm not a conservative yeah it's people no, it's out, people's it's... lives first of course yeah, of but course. when they make that argument they make that excuse it's a hollow one as well. Uh, and you've actually been threatened quite severely. Yeah, we've actually we're at the point of being cautious now. Um, and just to sort of clarify a few points there, we're actually, uh, we're just sort of at the, the starting point of our diagnosis. So we've been diagnosed, I've been diagnosed with a couple of conditions, Ellis Danlos syndrome and uh, it's called hyperogenic pots. Now, these aren't actually classed as CEV yet. Um, and we are in the middle of genetic investigations for a muscular dystrophy, which would class us as CEV. Now, there's a lot of families in this grey area mm. in which they're not, uh, they're not protected by the shielding, even though it, they've dropped it anyway. They're just not protected by that. And they're in this this transitional period where they've got you know the weight of the anxiety of these impending conditions happening and they're not being supported and it's it's literally because we're becoming it seems like we're becoming policy zombies to some degree in, in institutions and um in terms of the implications financially it's it, it's heavy and no parent should be forced into this decision one of the uh, councils at Liverpool sort of put it really lovely so it's a lifestyle choice home school and it's 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 something that needs to be really planned for um i've been forced into i'd choose it i would absolutely choose it every time especially for these reasons and the institutional abuses that can go on it, it's it, it's heavy it's it's very heavy but, but in no, time it, we could meet up we could have groups we could take our kids out and meet up we we're homeschooling with our arms tied behind our back. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, the the support from the unions and the people that are, um, like, we're creating a, a community learning platform now and it's in its sort of embryonic stage, but it's, it's emergent and it's, it's, it's absolutely beautiful, honestly. And it's, it, it's just a shame that we shouldn't be forced into this. We absolutely shouldn't be. And we are just that we're making the most of what we're doing um and that's all you can do to, to be completely honest but yeah it's it, it's difficult the the it, the they, implication sorry yeah no you you've you've uh you've, you've done an exceptional job of explaining what your situation is there it's absolutely bloody harrowing quite frankly um it's uh, i'm amazed actually you've managed to find some positives in the uh, in that you could um, you, you you found support you found support amongst local uh, community organisations and and unions as well. Um, another plug for joining a union because everybody. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's, you're not actually completely alone. I know you've actually you've actually got some some legal uh, uh, assistance coming down the line as well now. Yeah. Um, but this is far from a unique story, is it? This is no Michelle's story. It's a story of a lot of families out there, as and and will be even more so when Freedom Day arrives. Yeah. It's not very freeing. Is it? Uh, Emmy, do you want to come in and... No, it's anything but Freedom Day for us. I mean, I've seen it used. The, the hashtag is on Twitter, Incarceration Day. I mean, for us, 
the small little things. This is the hardest bit, and this is something he's talking a lot um, within our um, support groups and things. The little things that we could do safely. Tiny, tiny, tiny little things that we could do safely are gone now. Yeah, I mean, they're gone. I live in the seaside town. The only place to go is the beach. But mm -hmm. if we've got to use time, everybody's going to be on it. That's my With one mistake to go no to. No masks and no social distancing. And literally, this government has announced on the 19th COVID is no more. Well, no. Yeah. No. No, it, it's just not a thing. And it's literally going to force us back if you're not already still shielding. I know there's a lot of us out there. I am still That's shielding. I am, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm still at it. Um, and but it's, not, but it's unsupported, as you've said. It's on. Time. This is what I'm arguing. Helping you with this. This is my argument. And the problem is, I know I can bang the drum all day for this. Anybody that follows me on Twitter has seen I am banging the drum. Support. We need a support package. Yeah. Not just, you know, a letter, not just, you know, Blood Cancer UK, um, we're, support, we're absolutely supporting their call. They did a survey and 80% um, of um, people with blood cancer in the UK did not know that the vaccines may not work for them. Wow. Because nobody has spoken to us. Yeah. Nobody is addressing the CEV situation. To hear from um, a journalist yesterday about Professor Van Tam in a meeting with other charities saying that he agrees that not enough was done for shielding. Um, and, you but know, it would have killed them to put a page, you know, the NHS webpage, a little section at the bottom, how vaccines may affect your condition, whether they will work with it or not. They I don't mean, have the data. This is the problem. Yeah. They will not release the data that they do have. And again, okay. when I was on the show last time, and we're not getting that was one tests, thing no. that the problem with the antibody tests is. Um, I um, joined a webinar with Ross Society of Immunology. Yeah. They don't know how many antibodies you actually need. They don't know what the interaction is between B cells and T cells. cells. They don't know how much this is how much they don't know about covid so sure on the 19th let's just yeah. do away with all the safety measures they don't know how the t cells react per variant they don't oh. have the data to see any of this but they also don't know what it reenacts it's like i was no. reading a thread last night about um and also i'd read something the other day about in the few months after i had covid because i've also got long covid on top of everything else i've got which is great. I had shingles nine times and I thought it was just me. No. But apparently, mm -hmm. although people are getting it, and it's reactivating Epstein Barr and the virus behind lupus. Mm -hmm. It seems to just like get into the body and go, well, hey, it's virus open day. Yeah. The rheumatology, the Society for Rheumatology made it pretty clear that this is uh, autoimmune. It's not immune. No, it's autoimmune. No. It's this triggering what, odd. And this is the this problem. This is what people with ME, like me, have been saying since the very beginning. Hold on a minute. I got the ME after swine flu, by the way. This is going to be the same. This is going to create yeah. a lot of people in the same situation. Are you going to stick them all in the cupboard where you've kept us for the last 30 years? Yeah. Here's the problem with all. Our NHS cannot cope with no. the numbers at the moment. Oh. Michelle, you are definitely not the only family still in the middle of that diagnostic odyssey. Nope. For a child, it takes around about eight years to yeah. be diagnosed with yeah. a rare disease. Yeah. Um, in a classroom, one in every sixth chair will be affected by a long absence from school. These children are being exposed to a virus we know very, very little yeah. about the long COVID aspect, which terrifies me for my son. I mean, he got the flu, um, like the first week of flu season 2019, he didn't recover until the, the August, the next year. It's, we know, again, we know our children, we know ourselves. For us, CV, the question is if we survive long COVID, what the hell is that gonna actually do to us? Especially yeah. if we are already plagued with a broken immune system that hates us you know it's it's one of those things it's worse than ever it is it's really difficult no i mean what, since i've had covid bit, i've gone right back to the yeah. beginning of when i was diagnosed with me it's 
yeah it's a... everything is on a flare my migraines are off the scale my fibro is off the scale it, everything is just hyper activated and what's that going to do to children i mean like my son's got my my son's a selective eater he's got um sensory processing disorder so he has a terrible immune system mm. yeah my... he's also autistic so it's also explaining everything around it and getting him to the point where he gets his head around it, you know, and it, 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 but for a lot of clinically vulnerable children, that is going to be the issue as well. It is a huge issue. I mean, it really is. Last time I was on here, I was just talking about talking to the life limited um, families who really have a very valid point and why should they be expected to risk? Yes, so children survive COVID, but how much of ourselves do they lose? Yeah. Why should we be, why should any parent, because long, long COVID, what is it, between eight and nine percent, isn't it, will, of children yeah. will um, contract yeah. long COVID. I wouldn't wish an autoimmune disorder on my worst. No, head. I have one. Yeah. I don't want. Yeah, you know, it's, let it's alone children. Of, and the problem we've got as well is our CEV number grows every single day. The number of CV in the UK. So last count was when they um, realised they had to add in the learning disability community, which took them a year to work out. That yeah. was a thing. Um, shows you how much they're paying attention. Um, the number yeah. was 5.5 million. That number grows every single day with new diagnosis, yeah. with new treatments having to be started. And these people have nowhere to go. So there's, a, uh, you know, I know somebody who's just become CV yeah. and they have been told their CEV and that they need to shield and they have got only because they know me and are friends with me, they know what shielding yeah. is and they know, but this is happening to people like this with yeah. no warning in the worst possible circumstances. And there is no support. There's no There's support. No I mean, I, I, I know when I was diagnosed, I just got told blankly like that. Yeah, you've got this. Well, can you do anything about it? Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Right, and I went into a massive wanna, depression. Michelle, do you want to come back in at all uh, and comment on anything that's uh, been said? Um, yeah, I think I th it's hard because one, one of the sort of emergent uh, bits of evidence that's come on with long COVID is actually with POT, with postural orthostatic yeah. tachycardia. Um, now, if you've ever struggled to breathe, or you, you can't imagine the anxiety that comes with now when there's a, a respiratory uh, virus uh, you know in, in in your proximity it's it, it's terrifying now pot and others done this which i've been diagnosed with isn't classed as cv um and yet the genetic uh investigations that we've got it, we would be now the risk is still different for us regardless of whether we've got that diagnosis yet anyway you're going to find a lot of families that are in that transitional point of um you know, pens and diagnoses. And I was on list one, but not list two. The first shielding letter I got, and I was told I was on the shielding list, the second letter that went out, I didn't get. And yeah, well, I had to argue to get the vaccine in group six. But my GP did say I'd kind of been missed off because I had an invisible disability. Oh, <laughs> that's that's a lot. A lot I really do hate that phrase. Yeah, yeah, me too. Michelle, thank you so much for coming on and sharing that. I know that cannot have been easy to share uh, such a personal story. I know you are getting. I'm glad to hear you're getting some support. Actually, yeah, not just from organisations like Safehead and Shield Us, but also you're getting a little bit of legal advice. And excellent to hear that the trade unions are stepping up and yeah. uh, and helping you out as well. Yeah. Um, I want to, well, I've got to move on now because of time constraints, but Claire, regarding a, a freedom of information request that uh, your organisation, Safehead, is sent yeah. to the Department for Health and Social Care. Um, I've just had a, a, an email pretty much come through um, mm. from Safehead, um, a press release for immediate circulation. Yeah. So I'll circulate it. I'll just read it out a moment yeah. if I may. Um, on May 17th, 2021, the Department for Education no longer recommended that masks were used by secondary age students in classrooms. This decision was made despite the increased infection rates, the emergence of the Delta variant, and with no other scientific, scientifically recognized mitigations for controlling an airborne novel virus being implemented in UK schools. The recommendation for secondary students to wear a scientifically recognized Recognized that mitigation for an airborne virus was never mandatory and was not applied to primary age children. The recommendation was in place between March the 8th and May the 17th only. 
Uh, Safe Ed for All placed a freedom of information request with the Department for Education for the report that surely must have been undertaken for that decision to have been made to be released. And they have basically come back and said they refuse to honour it on the basis that it is still being used to formulate policy, which is rather interesting. But why would the report, which led to a policy decision that has already been made, not be released to the public? Is it not in the public's interest to understand why this policy decision was made and by whom? And transparency and understanding as to why this decision was taken would surely alleviate some of the misinformation and anxiety of this decision. They're hiding the data they are apparently following, just as they've hidden the modelling data, allegedly supporting opening up on the 19th. This government are taking us for fools. What's What, what have SafeEd found out? They'll, well, I mean, they'll, they'll be, they'll, they'll, I, I should imagine they're not releasing the data because there'll be projections. They know exactly how many people they're going to kill with this. There'll be projections of these figures, and that is why they're not releasing the data. I mean, Safe Ed, in the meantime, I mean, um, Sarah and a few other people are doing um, depositions to the APPG on coronavirus. We're following it up. I mean, we, we keep sending in requests for freedom of information requests, and we don't get them. Because, like you said, they're hiding the data. I mean, it's going to come out at some point. You know, yeah. people, it, it, you know, it's... 30 years down the line, like... No, I just, I just, that's all I'm, I was thinking. Am I still going to be alive when this comes out? That's how bad it is. Yeah, um, they'll probably lock it all down, won't they? But it's essentially playing, just playing games with people's lives. But uh, I mean, there's various other things. I mean, so I'm Sarah. So Sarah sent me a crib list, and I'm I'm not embarrassed to say I'm about to use it. <laughs> so um, we've done a parent declaration letter, which is basically um, it's got to the point where so many people have said we would like a letter that just says I do not consent. I'm not going to do this. I do not accept your school is safe, and that is out there. It's on our website, but it's also been on Twitter, and the links on Twitter to say, no, I do not consent. I'm not sending my, my child back to school in September. There's the dossier of evidence that we've presented to the APPG on coronavirus. Well, we have yet to present, we've prepared it. Um, we've also started some discussions with a law firm to bring a legal challenge against the DfE. We're part of that as well. Yeah, and Emmy's part <clears throat> of that as well, yeah. So um, I have to see where we get with that one. Um, it, the problem being, of course, it's the we're back to the guidelines again. It's guidelines. It's not laws and it's not regulations. It's guidelines. And, you know, their answer will be, having worked in schools, any school, these are guidelines. Any school could go above and beyond if they so choose. Mm. Mm, yes. It will be that. Um, we've also had quite a lot of coverage in radio, newspapers, um, and we've been doing a home education support service. We're doing a between us because quite a few of us are teachers or ex-teachers. Mm. So we are skill sharing to the max and uh, trying to set up a Zoom home education service for various age groups, uh, which is the brainchild of Sarah and Lisa. And I don't take any credit for it, for it at all. I'm just telling you about it. <laughs> but I'm I'm going to be contributing. You were a nominated spokesperson. You can own it. If I'm going to yeah. Oh. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to be contributing <laughs> on the English and French side. So that's my 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 field of expertise. But um, yeah, um, Daniela's continuing to collect the data on schools. Daniela Modos, so anybody who's not Daniela Modos cut it at the star, be. and my are, eyes would maps are brilliant. My eyes would boggle doing that information. I could not do it. Spreadsheets scare me, but she's been collating all the data on schools, and she's been an absolute star. And we are getting a lot more through now. A lot more parents are beginning to email things through. Um, We've sent some freedom of information requests as well to schools for positive cases. It's very interesting. A lot of these schools, when they send them through, when they come back, have not declared any cases at all. But they've had cases all along. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know, it's like um, my friend's daughter's school, the, the girl I said who we've just been in isolation because of, mm. according to the school, no cases. According to the freedom of information request, in that period of time over 40 cases yeah it's yeah. this and certain councils i think also have an active blackout on it and this is yeah. the problem schools because it's all guidelines as you said schools can act in accordance with however they wish if they want yeah. to bury it 
and pretend <laughs> it's not happening in their school, they can get away with it. It's only it. Get down the road of a freedom of information request that actually this information comes to light. Yeah. Can I just can I just add in um, sure. one of right. one of the really useful things, obviously that's that's going on with sharing this over social media, is that you get to see what's happening in other countries, how other yeah. countries are responding to what we're doing. Now, um, but through a lot of the conversations that have come about through the the um, the cautionary letter that we got as a family was things that the issues that come up with this type of thing is for example someone in Bavaria there's families literally moving districts to yeah. get to somewhere in which the, the policies and the guidances on, on school, uh, school risk mitigations uh, better serve them for the health and it's you know are we, are we going to become migrants of our own communities to find a, a safe place that our, our, our kids can be educated and these questions they're not small questions and we'll I'm just so glad we're beginning to get organised in, in answering them together. Yeah, I mean that's that's the I mean that the other thing for me for me joining Safe Head for All was a was an amazing thing because I had been made yeah. just like you, Michelle, to feel that I, I well I, it had been implied that I was over anxious. Yeah, uh, maybe I needed mental health support. <laughs> <laughs> that needed weighed me to send my child back to school. You know, I I'm not particularly anxious. I've got an MA myself, you know, my other daughter's at university. You know, and we'd all been isolated, marginalised. They sort of pick us off one by one. And I think that the great thing Safe Ed for All and Shield Us have done is make you realise you're not alone. And the because, collaboration. Yeah. Because yeah. you're seen as a fringe group, yeah. which yeah. is ridiculous. Mm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, again, it's, it's. I don't know if anybody saw. Um, Francis Ryan wrote um an amazing piece in the Guardian um about disability discrimination and what it really means to be vulnerable, um in the UK and, you know, in England alone, sixty one thousand disabled people have lost their life to COVID. Yep. You know, sixty percent. You know, the, the numbers. Part of the huge. problem of those that have passed away are people who are disabled and CEV. It's been we are we we it's, it's known we we account for a huge number There's of no representation though. It's like when I was no. a counsellor, if I'm you know my disability came up like I spent a year as deputy mayor and I'm like I'm going to need transport. Deputy mayor doesn't get transport and I'm like I have disabilities. Well, you have to pay for a taxi then, won't you? It's disgusting, isn't and it? It is. It's like there's no representation at sort of town council, city council, MPs. I mean, I've been part of Project 125, which is trying to get, if we had the disabled MPs to represent us in line with the the amount of people with disabilities in the, in the country, there would be 125 of them. Mm. But there's nobody there to speak up because we are kept so down by just being disincluded that we never get to that point. No, absolutely. I mean, for a lot of us disabled people, I'm physically disabled. I am a wheelchair user. Um, and you don't knock. What is, what, there's amazing lessons that have come out. There's amazing tools come out. Look at this, what we're doing right now. We're all over the country. Keep it. Keep these things going. Keep the, the you know, the remote um, medicine where you can... Yep. Zoom, if you, you're in a position where you do not need to be traveling, because a lot of these specialist centers, they're not on your doorstep. No. You know, public transport for disabled people has never been, you know, the best thing it's in the world. And it, it, it's it's impossible. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a lot of towns and cities are still not designed for wheelchairs. These yeah. things that have changed and evolved through COVID. COVID is, again, it is I say it all the time, it's, people are sick of hearing me say it, COVID has laid bare every inequality yeah. in this country. Every it, single it's one. A game, it's a game changer. This could be the chance to change those. This could be the chance to reset those. Mm -hmm. Because it's, they've been laid so bare. And, they uh, have. And, and people are acting like, you know, oh, it's because of COVID. No, no, this has been going on a very long time. No, it's like the NHS stuff. It's been being privatised for ages. Mm -hmm. You know, private ambulance companies, they've been in there for ages. You know, um, 
letting out public health services to Virgin Care, stuff like that. That's all been yeah. in, happening for ages, sneakily, one by one by one by one. Oh, you want to go to the podiatrist, you've got to pay. You want to go here, you need your ear syringing, you've got to pay. It's been nibbled at. And then people are like, oh, you know, it's all public. No, it's not. No. No, it's so, not. The no. situation, sorry, Damien, go ahead. Uh, go on, Amy, make the, the last point, and I've got to, you know, the time constraint, I've got to move on. Yeah, my, my point was going to be with education environment. I mean, right now in Northern Ireland, our schools are finished for some summer, and we're all going back in September. They're not, the school environment isn't safe for our CEB. End story. Our children are catching long COVID. Our young people are catching long COVID. You know, that puts them into a CEV category. Our number is growing. Yes, unfortunately, it is a high number of our CEV that we will lose. Yes, the government could publish the modelled figures of what hospitalisation and deaths are going to look like. They're not going to do it. They are, we heard through our journalists that there's talk of, you know, um, immunosuppressed having to shield till September. We're waiting on a press release from that, however long that yeah. may be. The lack of information, the lack of mitigation, the just acting like come the 19th, COVID is gone. This is an, it's an infringement on human right and liberty. Yeah. And I right think to more life. and more people are beginning to wonder what is driving this government now. I mean, I, would say I know so. who are not political, but who mm -hmm. have disabilities are going... Do they want to kill us? And I'm like, I've been telling you that for a it's while. It's getting difficult to say no to that, isn't it? Quite <coughs> now, as a final point, we do try and find a positive on Socialist Telly. We, we try. It's not always possible, not quite frankly. But uh, coming out of this, there is pushback. There's pushback from organisations such as yourselves um, and obviously the scientific community as well. There's a, a, an excellent article that was published in The Lancet. Um on Thursday, and of course there was a press conference that day led by Dr. Deepti Gurdasani of Queen Mary University. Um, but the pushback needs to come from Parliament as well. Have you had any support from parliamentarians still? Parliamentarians outside the government yet? And did any of you see the press conference or read that Lancet article this week? Um, I've read yeah, the Lancet I... article. I haven't seen the press conference yet. I saw the press conference. Unfortunately, I was meant to be on asking a question, but a delay in email meant it didn't happen. But I will be on with Independent Sage um, asking um, questions around regarding um, shielding right now and immunosuppressed and trying to get some answers for a really frightened community right now. Really it frightened. Is, it is an excellent press conference. It is still available mm -hmm. on YouTube. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm going to. It was, it was a migraine that stopped me being there. Thank but, you um, so much. Thank you so much once more to Claire and Emmy, Safe Aid for All and for Shield Us for coming back on the Socialist Telly and uh, telling us like it is, frankly, explaining what's going on, explaining what the government are not telling us mm. and what they're not doing and their uh, irresponsibility and indeed what organisations such as theirs are doing. So do give them a follow on social media. Thanks also very much to Michelle for coming on to share a story today. I know this was not easy for you to do, but you've done it. You did amazingly well. And I hope she will keep us updated and hope things reach a positive conclusion for her. Um, follow these guys. Join these organizations. Know your rights. I will yep. see you on the next show. Cheers, folks.